All right, Geraint, our question for today is, what is the cosmic microwave background? Mm. Well, we hear about the cosmic microwave background an awful lot when you look at modern cosmology. Mm -hmm. And you'll hear phrases like the afterglow of creation and things (laughs) like that. But of course, it's, it's a physical thing, right? It's something that we measure. And essentially, the cosmic microwave background, this is radiation that's arriving at the earth Mm -hmm. from all directions and this radiation it it appears in the microwave part of the spectrum so so you know that we can observe the sky in a whole range of wavelengths and we have telescopes that can look in the x-ray and the gamma ray section optical telescopes radio telescopes if we look in most of those telescopes we see essentially dots on the sky, right? We see Mm -hmm. sources of radiation in the optical, it's stars and galaxies. In radio waves, you see radio jets and you see hearts of uh, very powerful active galaxies. Mm -hmm. But when we get to this sort of microwave region, what we actually see is that there is a sort of smooth background over the entire sky. Mm -hmm. And this is essentially what the cosmic microwave background is. It's this smooth background of radiation which arrives at the Earth in all directions. So, as a, in the history of astronomy, was anyone expecting us to see that sort of thing when we looked up at the sky? Well, let, let's remember the history of cosmology, a modern cosmology. Right. And, of course, it, it gets off to a start with Einstein's work mm-hmm. in the uh, very early 1900s, um, whereby, he, you know, eventually we could come up with a mathematical framework to describe the universe mm-hmm. in terms of his uh, general theory of relativity. Mm-hmm. Of course, Einstein got off to a few false starts, assuming that the universe was static, but it was people like Friedman that showed that the universe could either be expanding and contr- or contracting. And mm-hmm. eventually the observations by Hubble mm-hmm. showed that our universe is actually expanding. So there were a number of people, including like Lamartra, mm-hmm. who said, well, let's wind this backwards and ask what kind of conditions our universe must have had when it was much younger. Mm-hmm. And... If you just take the universe today and you wind it backwards, you get everything packed closer and closer together. And you realize that the temperature of stuff in the universe must have been higher in the past, right? In the same way, if you squeeze a gas, the gas gets hotter, Mm -hmm. right? The universe itself must have been hotter in the past. Mm -hmm. And this is this notion of the hot Big Bang. Our universe was born in a very in a hot, dense state, to quote a soon-to-be-finishing TV show, fundamental particles at a very high temperature. Those particles, electrons and protons, electrons and positrons, and the quarks all buzzing around, but in a soup with radiation, with photons, Mm -hmm. extra high-energy photons. And then what um, basically worked by people like Alpha and Herman and um, uh, Beta and Gamma, they realized that in this early stage of the universe, uh, as the universe cooled down and we go from this super fundamental particles, then the atoms must mm-hmm. basically condense out of this hot soup, mm-hmm. right? There's also the radiation, right? The radiation is bouncing around and as the universe expands, this radiation must also cool down. Mm-hmm. And so there was a prediction that the Earth should be bathed in this leftover radiation from this very hot state, Mm -hmm. and it should be still around us today. So so these predictions in the 1940s and 50s, and then people sort of started looking and wondering if they could detect this radiation by the time the 1960s came along. Right, so this is one of the interesting things where, uh, in the history of cosmology, you've got people who are trying to find this thing Right, so they're trying to build the sort of instrument that can see this leftover radiation. And uh, someone who wasn't looking for this radiation kind of beats them to the crunch. That's right. So there were two radio astronomers, Penzias and Wilson. And they heard of a, uh, effectively a radio telescope, but it wasn't a telescope as such. It was a receiver mm-hmm. set up to receive signals uh, bounced off satellites. Right. Mm-hmm. So they figured, well, it's a receiver then maybe we could use it as a radio telescope. So it was no longer collecting information from satellites. It was essentially just sitting there. And they thought, if we point it towards the sky, we can use it as a radio telescope. Mm -hmm. Now, being uh, radio astronomers, of course, they wanted the best instrumentation possible. And so they went to the electronics in the the detector. Mm -hmm. And what you want to do is always reduce the noise. There's always hiss due to the temperature of the detector, etc. So how do we make that as quiet as possible? Because that means you can detect as faint a source as possible. Mm -hmm. And they understood the electronics and they found that there was this leftover hiss that they couldn't account for. Mm 
So they sought out uh, the potential sources, and this is a famous story that uh, they removed uh, white dielectric material from inside <laughs> the detector, mm-hmm. inside the telescope, which was pigeon crap. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, that didn't remove the hiss. They actually removed the pigeons. Uh, apparently, the story is with an air rifle. They removed, <laughs> so uh, they still couldn't remove the hiss. And uh, so eventually, you know, they concluded that that this detector was picking up this hiss from space. It didn't mm. change wherever they pointed their telescope, etc. There was this leftover hiss. And they didn't know what it was, and so they contacted astronomers at Princeton, mm. and apparently at Princeton they were developing the detectors to search for this, and the, yeah. the, the Princeton astronomers realized that they had been scooped. This is one of those things where, in the history of science, you need to make note of something weird happens, because someone might be looking for that something weird that you've just found. Uh, and in fact, there, there, were, uh, there were some of these weird things happening in detections before... Mm. Um, the the discovery of the cosmic microwave background itself, people realized that there must be a bath of radiation out there because molecules appeared to be a bit too energetic. But of course, they, there was they were not even expecting there to be leftover radiation, so they just noted it and then wandered off and carried on doing their other research. What's the last thing that this light scattered off? What are we actually seeing? So, um, as I mentioned, we this is all coming from radiation in the very early stages of the universe. Mm-hmm. And that radiation is when the universe was hot and young. Mm-hmm. It was very, very dense. So that radiation couldn't travel very far before, before it bounced off uh, basically the particles in the universe. Mm-hmm. The universe continued to cool, but it was still, you know, after the first three minutes, it was essentially still a soup mm-hmm. of hydrogen and helium, but not atoms of hydrogen and helium. It was still too hot for the electrons to join onto the atoms. Mm-hmm. So it was a plasma. And... Photons don't travel very far through a plasma. Yeah. Right? They bounce around. About almost 400,000 years after the Big Bang, mm-hmm. the temperature of the universe had cooled down enough, i.e. particles were rattling around with less and less speed, that electrons could join to protons to form the first hydrogen atoms yep. and to helium to form the first helium atoms, etc. Mm-hmm. And then after that point, once you have formed an atom then light doesn't bounce off that so easily anymore. Mm -hmm. So suddenly after about 400,000 years, the light could travel freely. It didn't scatter every, you know, every time it tries to to move previously, it bounced off an electron, etc. After that point, the electrons were bound, the light could travel freely. So this is the interesting part, right? So the radiation that we are detecting on Earth today has traveled, you know, many billions of light years Mm -hmm. to, to get here. So we are receiving that radiation from a point in the very early universe, okay, which is located somewhere else in the universe today. Yeah. So we are basically surrounded by this shell of um, stuff from which we receive this radiation. Mm-hmm. But it, today that, that's like us, mm-hmm. right? Well, we has galaxies and stars. But the time that that radiation was emitted, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, it was still this soup. Right. Right. So, um, and in fact, on the converse side, of course, is that if there are any creatures out there, a similar distance away, looking back at us, yeah. they see us as we were four hundred thousand years ago. So the radiation which was here, yeah, in the Milky uh, in the Milky Way when the universe was four hundred thousand years old, is now billions of light years away, mm-hmm. and conversely, that light from billions of light years away is now arriving here. Right. So obviously after Penzias and Wilson discover this, you know, every cosmologist and, and astronomer wants to take a closer look. How have we done that in the last uh, well, 50 years, I suppose? Um, well, let, let's, we have to go back a little bit and think about what we're actually seeing with the cosmic microwave mm-hmm. background. Now, I mentioned that the radiation that we see comes from all directions, mm-hmm. but it's not completely uniform. So firstly, there's what's known as the dipole, right? Mm -hmm. So our Earth is moving through the universe relative to the cosmic microwave background radiation. And that means you get a Doppler shift of that radiation because of our motion. Mm -hmm. And so in the direction that we're moving towards, it gets slightly blue shifted, so it gets slightly hotter. Mm -hmm. So people see that there's a dipole. Mm -hmm. But you 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 can measure that very easily with telescopes on Earth. But people have invested a lot of time and effort to put satellites into space away from the Earth's atmosphere, which is is not a clear window to this microwave radiation. Mm -hmm. So you put put satellites in space or you put uh, detectors on balloons, Mm -hmm. get high up in the atmosphere. 
and you're looking for fine detail on the cosmic microwave background. Mm -hmm. So there's this pattern, and if you've seen it, any pictures of this, you see that there's this lovely ripple pattern mm -hmm. across the sky, which is written into the cosmic microwave background radiation. Now, astronomers are very keen to understand that pattern because that pattern comes from what the universe looked like 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. So what you've got is, at that point, the universe wasn't completely smooth anymore. Mm -hmm. Gravity had been acting for 400,000 years. And so the first sites of the first galaxies were already in place. So matter had already started to fall together in places mm -hmm. and empty out in other places. Okay? So we had places which were slightly more dense and slightly less dense. And these are tiny differences, factors of about, you know, one part in 10,000. But that meant that gravity was slightly stronger in some places than other places, which means that this cosmic microwave background radiation, when it was emitted, some of it found itself slightly deeper in a gravitational potential mm -hmm. and others in a slightly less deep gravitational potential. And photons have to use a little bit of energy to climb out of these deep potentials. Mm -hmm. So in mapping the cosmic microwave background, we actually get a picture, a snapshot of what matter was doing in the universe 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So, so this is where this gets really cool because... Firstly, we can then play that matter distribution forward. Mm. And what we see is it, uh, it evolves essentially into the, the rich structure we see around us today, the cosmic web uh, where we have voids and clusters and mm -hmm. sheets and filaments. But then we have to ask the question of where that structure on the cosmic microwave background came from. Now, I think this is an area that you know a little bit about. Well, this is, we have to obviously go back earlier and to try to think, okay, there are these little ripples in, in the matter density and space and time in the universe. Where could they have come from? And the best theory we have about that is what's called cosmic inflation. There's this very, very early time, and you're talking 10 to the minus 30 seconds, something like that, ridiculously early, where if, if the universe had undergone a really fast expansion, a really rapid exponential doubling every a given amount of time sort of expansion then that would explain some stuff about our universe. And in particular, in most of these models, would have actually laid down the kind of pattern of ripples that we actually see in the night sky. So that's, that's how we could take this pattern that we see and it couldn't tell us something about the very, very, very earliest stages of our universe. So I think that's really cool. It's that you, you know, you can use physics, and there's lots of different physics here, right? You've mm -hmm. got the physics of the expanding universe, and you've got the physics of nuclear reactions, and the physics of quantum processes. Mm -hmm. And you can pin them all together to give us the history of the universe from a tiny fraction of a second after it was born to today. Hmm. Well, let's finish with a question we, we often get, uh, which is some people have a picture of the Big Bang happened at a point, and then there was all this matter released, and all this... Uh, light release but wouldn't the light just be somewhere else why do we see the light here if it all just came from a point in an explosion and of, of course i mean the, the the right way to think about this is is that the big bang wasn't an explosion of stuff yeah. into pre-existing space but it was and i hate to say this it was the creation of space and time itself right. modular whatever happened before <laughs> right yeah. but we'll come to that another time which means that every point in the universe once it was born was in the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. So every point in the universe was in a hot, dense state. So we were hot and dense here, and our photons have flowed away from us. Mm -hmm. But all of the other points in the universe were also in hot, dense state states, and now their photons are, floating, are flowing towards mm -hmm. us. So we are in this bath surrounded by all those other points that were part of the Big Bang. All right, so that's the cosmic microwave background. It's a crucial source of information about the universe. Absolutely.